Uh, all right, friends, welcome back. Sarah and I, we have our props. We can sit here and Sarah, show us your rosary. Um, this is one of the rosaries that I have. Can you see it? It's a, uh, it's, oh, it's a turn gold. It there you go. Yep, there we go. And um, like Karen said, you know, it's got the crucifix suspended at the end of the chain with a, with all of the different beads. And um, this one was one of one of many rosaries that, uh, after my mom passed away, um, we were graced to inherit. So um, each of my kids has one of the one of their grandmother's rosaries, and uh, hopefully that will always be a special, you know, memoir of her because she she had a great devotion to the rosary. Beautiful, beautiful. One of one of my favorite rosaries um, is uh, this one. It's Stephen Mosier. He's with Population Research Institute. He does uh, uh, yeoman's work for decades on the persecuted church in China. And this one was brought back, oh, maybe about 25, 30 years ago from the underground Chinese. So I like it on Sunday um, and in a special way. But oh, so you can see that they're, you know, the crucifix is painted on, you know, the large bead, the small beads. Um, this doesn't have a medallion. Sometimes they do. This one doesn't. And so that was one. Yeah, and medallions are often double sided. So this one has on mine, it has one side is an image of the Blessed Mother. Yes. Yeah. And then on the back would be an image of the Sacred Heart. So That's really. Correct. That is correct. That is correct. And then here's a simple one from uh, Order, the Founders in Peru. And so you see it's just painted on, pretty, very simple wooden beads. So all different kinds. And so what Sarah was talking about with a distraction, she is so right that the, you know, the rosary comes to us in our humanity. And I'll... Uh, be talking about this a little, a little ways to keep our um, focus. So maybe I'll hold off on these pictures till we get to our practice. We have a section always on practical suggestions. But that's the, the rosary. The rosary in St. Dominic. Um, this is from an article by uh, a Dominican, 1996, Father Paul Duffner. The apostolic those are all good, all good historians. We're going to, you always got to back up, get a little running circuit. So he's going to start back with the apostolic fathers. He gets a running, he gets a running start, man. Right. I mean, it is funny and yet it's so very necessary because we both know that one of the primary criticisms about the rosary is that it's not biblical. That's right. And so for, for those of us who are trying, you know, to to engage in a world that looks at this as, you know, idolatry at worst or, you know, super superstition at best, right? Harmless superstition. These are not beliefs that are not anchored in something solid. Um, even the prayer itself has um, has very strong foundations. And so although it is kind of funny that we're that you have to go back to the apostolic times, it is too a great grace that we're capable of doing such a thing. So that is right. That is that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So Ignatius of Antioch, he's one of the earliest post-biblical Christian authors. You know, one one eighty, um, yeah, some, maybe one twenties, yeah. very early. He's reflecting on how Mary, by understanding Mary, we understand Jesus. His letters to the various churches um, are, are noted on his way to martyrdom in Rome, and they offer a wealth of information about the early church. As was typical of the time, he does not say much about Our Lady, but what he does say is quite revealing. Ignatius's importance in this regard is his witness to some of the earliest liturgical traditions in the church. In his letters, he offers various professions of faith, undoubtedly used in many liturgical celebrations. And I say undoubtedly because they, they have a formulaic approach. They have a liturgical sound to them. And that's why scholars will say they were used in liturgy prior even 
to his writing. So that's very early. Of these creeds, mention Mary and the and present her as the mother of Christ according to his human nature, and God the Father is his father according to his divine nature. In his letter to the church in Ephesus, he writes, there is one physician who's possessed both of flesh and spirit, both made and not made, God existing in flesh, true life and death, both of Mary, and there's, there's the key for us, and of God, first passable, and then impassable, Jesus Christ our Lord, um, Ephesians chapter seven, chapter uh, book seven, chapter two. The motherhood of Mary becomes a part of God's plan of salvation, and Mary has the honor of being the one who inserts Christ into the line of David's descendants in a uh, physical way. David, I mean, Joseph does so as well, but through uh, the act of adoption. Um, just like Octavia, you know, the Caesar did with um, his son. So that's allowing him to fulfill the messianic pro prophecies. He affirms this in his letter to the church in Trellis. Stop your ears, therefore, when anyone speaks to you at variance with Jesus Christ, who was descended from David and was also of Mary, who was truly born and ate and drank. He was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate. He was truly crucified, truly died in the sight of beings in heaven and earth and under the earth. He was also truly raised from the dead. Tralians 9.1. In his time, Ignatius was struggling against the heresy of Docetism, a heresy which denied the reality of the incarnation. According to this heresy, Jesus is not truly man, but was rather a kind of spiritual phantasm. And I thought that was especially fitting since we're still in the Easter season, right. um, uh, countering that uh, heresy. They what is also so astounding is that this is such a short amount of time, right? They went from believing that he was only man, who claimed to be God, to in a hundred years after his death, believing that he was only God and not man. Right? I mean, we we... We, it seems as though human, the human person is constantly at battle with the, the physical and the spiritual being able to unite in such proximity. And um, I, I think that the rosary itself lends itself to that union of mind and spirit, uh, mind and body, because you're or spirit and body, because there's something concrete, right? We're holding on to something tangible as we're doing this prayer, right? So we are anchored in our humanity. At the same time, we're, we're liberated. Um, through those beads to attain a, a high level of spirituality. Um, that is right. That is right. Um, Ignatius, they considered undignified for God to have a human body. And because of this, and because of his, his Ignatius contesting of this heresy, he emphasized strongly the fact that Christ was truly born from the Virgin Mary thus testifying to the church's belief in the incarnation and the value of Christ's redemptive action. Mary truly engendered the flesh of Christ. She truly carried him about in her virginal womb, and she truly gave birth to him. This was all part of God's saving plan. And um, so in there, we're about to go into testimony of the popes through the ages. But uh, Sarah said something exactly right, that this is, there is this union between um, physical and spiritual. I, there is a strong current of wanting it just for some to just be all about the head. Right. All about, we don't, and you can see this in some places where the architecture is so impoverished. Yeah. Or... Um, yeah. Can I also add to that? Because it sure. goes back to those terms that you would use before about the passibility and the impassibility. Um, okay. I think that those are not common words for most people. And they have to understand that it has to do with passio, with suffering. So that he received his ability to suffer from the Blessed Mother, right? And the impassibility, the inability to suffer is of his divine element. And if you look at it from that standpoint, it seems very obvious that the docetists would like to ignore the passibility right? It's so much more beautiful to think that there needs to be no suffering, right? But our Lord, our Lord, through his own incarnation, somehow speaks boldly to the beauty that is 
potentially inherent in suffering. That passibility is fundamental to, to the love that God has for his people. It's, it's a necessary element. It is a necessary element. During um, some recent ref reading of reflection, you know, it seems so straightforward how the Lord created man with a word, with a breath into the nostrils. But with how much it seems difficult and fraught with suffering it was to redeem man. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Right, because it requires our um, <laughs> our cooperation without compromising of free will. Yeah. All right. Well, we will stop there and pick up with testimony of the popes. Till the next time, fides et ratio. <laughs>